Okay, so today we're going to talk about Christian heresies. Uh, we've seen that in the first three centuries since the time of Jesus, in the period we call primitive Christianity, there is no central authority, there's no pope, they've not put together the New Testament yet, they've not agreed upon what the organizational structure of this new religion is going to be. What you had were scattered groups of people that spread pretty quickly throughout the empire in small groups who had responded to the message of Jesus. Uh, love God, love your neighbor, this fulfills the Jewish legal tradition, Mosaic law. During his lifetime, Jesus spoke about love of God and neighbor, and that was what his audience understood. They would have heard him as a prophet, Amos and Micah and the others. He's a prophet deepening people's understanding. But all that changes with his untimely death and the stories of his resurrection. And that's what begins to transform Christianity into a very different kind of religion, one that holds that its founder was not just an enlightened moral, but that he was divine himself in some way. St. Paul, very early on, defines the nature of this, the importance of this, and changes the whole emphasis, really, in many ways from the life of Jesus and what he said to the significance of his death. And the idea that his death was actually the fulfillment of God's long plan to redeem humanity from the original sin through Adam. And this now becomes the central message. And we can see the, uh, the change happening when you compare the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the way Jesus talks there and what gets emphasized, to what happens in John's gospel, which already begins to show this new Christ, uh, Christology or, or belief about Christ that is emerging. Uh, but after that, however, the apostles died, Paul dies, and there really is nobody officially, centrally in charge of the religion. So all these different groups hold those basic tenets that love God and love your neighbor is the way to live. They share the ritual of a communal meal together, and they all believe after St. Paul that the founder is divine. So they all share that. Beyond that, there's room for a great variety of belief and ritual and practice that will emerge. And this is the period called primitive Christianity, when the earliest Christians were essentially inventing what this religion was going to be. Now, obviously, we can't have every belief get absorbed together. There's going to have to be some line of thought that's going to emerge and become the official view of the church. And so this is what begins happening by about the end of the first century, turn of the second century. We start to have to make decisions about what is going to be the orthodox belief of the church. Orthodoxy. Do you know any words that begin with ortho? Orthopedic. An orthopedic surgeon? Orthodontist? <laughs> right. What does an orthodontist do to your dentines, your teeth? No, the orthodontist. That's what your dentist does. Straightens them. Straightens them and corrects them. Exactly. So ortho means straight or correct. And doxy means belief. So orthodox literally means the correct belief. And the problem is there's nobody in charge to declare what the correct belief is. So many different beliefs are going to emerge, and it's only going to be in the 4th century, after the legalization of Christianity, that there's going to be uh, one branch of these early Christians that will become the dominant power, allied with imperial power and money, that's going to declare themselves and their beliefs orthodox, and everybody else will be rejected as a heretic. The word heretic and heresy, remember what this means. It's in the footnote of your reading. It is from the Greek word hereticos, which means to make a choice, as in to choose a school of thought by which to live your life. It reminds us of a time in ancient Greece and Rome where people didn't turn to religion as a moral guide, an ethical guide for life. They turned to philosophy for this. And well-bred young men were expected to sample the many philosophical schools and make a choice as to which one would be the way they would structure their lives. So the word heretic originally is not a scary word. It just means a, a different school of thought. There are many philosophies and schools of thought in the ancient world. It takes on that kind of scary, nasty meaning because the Orthodox bishops who are now triumphant are rejecting these other schools of thought in increasingly uh, pointed and angry terms. The same way that the word pagan, which really just means a farmer or a peasant, pagan, uh, doesn't mean anything scary until later these ones that won't convert, these farmers that stick to fertility cults, their vitriol against them makes that word sound kind of bad. 
So we're trying to figure out ultimately what is going to be orthodoxy and what is going to be the belief of a church that will eventually come to call itself Catholic. Do I have any Catholics in the room? Does anybody define what the word Catholic means? Ah, uh, Catholics never know what the word Catholic means. <laughs> the word Catholic means universal. Nowadays, we think of Catholic as like a proper noun of the old church compared to the Protestant churches after Martin Luther, we call it the Catholic and Protestant churches. But Catholic is originally an adjective describing what they're trying to achieve, a universal church that everybody can understand and belong to and be unified in their beliefs. So we're searching for what is going to be this Catholic belief that will become the orthodoxy. And there's another term, one more to put over here. Apostolic as in the apostles. The basic problem is that the apostles are all dead when these new questions begin to emerge. There's nobody to, you know, there's nobody to go and ask them, you know, what did you guys really think about this or that issue uh, related to Jesus? And so the later church has got to figure out basically what the apostles would have thought had we been able to ask them this question. So trying to find out what is the Catholic and apostolic belief, defining what is orthodoxy and rejecting what is heresy going to be a major concern for the church, especially after it becomes legalized, and they realize all the varieties of beliefs that have emerged in the 300 years since the death of Jesus. Okay? So in your reading, you had a, uh, some reviews of some of the major groups. There's a dozen others we could also talk about if we had more time. We're looking at the major ones, and particularly the ones where the official church's reaction to them is going to help shape what becomes Christian theology, uh, as we'll see. So I had you read about a bunch of them, and a lot of them have to do with the nature of the divinity of Jesus. The whole religion is transformed with the resurrection stories and the belief that Jesus was somehow divine. But what does that really mean? Was he God himself down here? Was he part God? Was he, and how much? So I gave you a few different versions. I'm going to kind of go over them all. Uh, with sort of a running equation theme behind it. Okay. So first of all, there are people who believe that Jesus, while really super cool, is 0% divine and 100% moral. People that like the message of Jesus think it's a great moral code to live by, but don't go so far as to accept that he was personally divine. This was just one God, and so you can't have another one. What kind of people would fit this category? Well, no, we're about to explore them. But what kinds of other people think that Jesus is really awesome, great message, but they just don't hold it? It's oh, actually the Jews. Jews. The Jews. Okay, so the Jews think of him as a prophet. Who else does? Muslims. Muslims, exactly. Muslims consider Jesus in the line of prophets, of which Muhammad was the last of the prophets. So they both admire him. Uh, many Westerners are always surprised to find out that Jesus is in the Quran. They, he's a respectable part of the tradition. They just don't hold the divinity aspect. Ironically, it's one of the things that Jews and Muslims agree upon is that Christians sort of went overboard and deified their prophet and founder uh, rather than just looking at the message that he brought. To this, we might also add Buddhists. We think Jesus is pretty cool. Hindus, I like him. Um, you might put other admirers of Jesus. And a, a phrase I remember as a kid, people would call themselves Red letter Christians. You ever heard the phrase red letter Christians? Check to see if your grandma has an old Bible where all the quotes from Jesus are in red type. Remember, that's the kind we had growing up. Some of y'all remember this? And so they do that so that if you just want to skip all the other stuff and just get to what Jesus actually said, you can very quickly zero in. I remember my grandmother used to say, just pay attention to the stuff in red letters, all right, and you'll be fine. Uh, however, if you don't accept the actual divinity of Jesus, it's sort of hard to actually call yourself a Christian, even though you might live by that code. Technically speaking, you're supposed to accept that. All right, so there's plenty of people that like Jesus. They just don't hold his divinity. Okay? Then there are other groups as well. And actually, I'm going to take a quick sidebar to talk about somebody that's not exactly uh, germane to this issue, but he's important because he's going to bring up the whole problem of heresy to begin with. Uh, and that is a character named Marcion.
from your reading, you may recall that Marcion was the son of a Christian bishop. He was a wealthy, uh, uh, part of a wealthy shipowning family and well-educated and very interested in Christianity. And the controversy comes up when Marcion is going to uh, offer a huge monetary donation to this early struggling Christian church in exchange for a platform upon which he can preach his views of all this. And his particular issue comes when he goes beyond reading the Gospels he had access to. Remember, there's no New Testament yet, but he had Luke's Gospel. He had some letters of Paul. He likes all that stuff. Love God, love your neighbor. That's awesome. Then he gets to the Hebrew Bible. He's a good scholar. He's doing his research. He's looking at the background. And when he gets to some parts of the Hebrew Bible, he's going to have the same kind of uncomfortable reaction that a lot of you had when you had to write the Hebrew Bible paper. When you get back to Deuteronomy 20 and the old Bronze Age war songs and stuff, Yahweh of the Hebrew Bible comes off as violent and angry and doesn't sound a whole lot different than Zeus commanding the slaughter of the Canaanite peoples, taking their women, killing their animals. I mean, it's, it's horrible stuff. I mean, we understand historically that well, these were all Bronze Age songs and things were violent back then. They, they grew out of it. But in the ancient world, they didn't have a sense of, well, let's look at it in historical context. It's sacred scripture. It's all supposed to be accurate. So they weren't able to read it the way we were able to read it. So Marcion's reading all this, and his grand revelation is that the God that Jesus talked about is simply completely different than the God of the Jews, of the Hebrew Bible. That that was some alien, violent God who made this world of pain and suffering, and that Jesus came to talk about a much higher deity, a deity of surpassing benevolence and love. And so Marcion's position is that, let's just reject all this old Hebrew Bible stuff. Well, why do we need all this anyway? Jesus gave us the message, and Paul explained it all. So let's just have some Gospels and some letters of Paul, and base Christianity on that, or reject all that old Jewish stuff. Now, obviously, Marcion lost this debate because you've never heard of him, and you have heard of the Old Testament. In fact, this is when the Old Testament is going to get that name. Uh, but think about it. Why do you suppose the early church would have decided not to go with Marcion? Certainly, there's a lot of problematic things in the, in the Old Testament, a lot of weird, violent stuff you've got to somehow deal with. Why not just reject it? Why do we need all the old stuff? Any thoughts? What if Jesus died for it? Well, yeah. So, I mean, if you're going to look at St. Paul's theology, I mean, it's all linked all the way back to Adam. So, St. Paul is going to establish this connection. You can't just look at Jesus as a wisdom teacher all by himself. He's part of that tradition. What do you think would have been the sociological effects? What would have happened to the church if they decided that all that Jewish stuff is a bunch of hooey? It would have collapsed. Well, it would split. And we're talking turn of the first century here. So the church is about half Jewish Christians and half Gentile Christians, Greek and Roman Christians. If you tell your congregation all that Jewish stuff is malarkey, who's going to leave? All your Jewish Christians are going to leave. And your church is going to split. And you're going to end up with a Gentile Christian church and a Jewish Christian church. You're going to have two churches. Is that what we want? No, we want something Catholic, something universal. You can almost predict how all these debates are going to end if you just think about those words. They almost always seem to come to the conclusion that's going to try to keep everybody in a single church and avoid being overly puritanical and cause a bunch of splintering into different churches. So Marcion uh, gets rejected, and gets to keep his money, uh, and he has the dubious honor of being Christianity's very first heretic. He is the first school of thought that is officially rejected by an emerging consensus within the church. So that's it for Marcion. Very good. We'll get back to the debate. Because the big question really was the divinity of Jesus. The final result of the whole Marcion thing is that the church did have to make a decision on what we do with the Hebrew Bible. And that's when they start calling it an Old Testament. And it'll be a while till they figure out what goes in a New Testament but they're making this distinction between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. You know, the Old Law and the New Law. And all those really weird stories and stuff that's kind of hard to believe, literally, they just sound mythological. People turn them into pillars of salt and get swallowed by whales and stuff. Uh, this is when they start that process of interpreting all that strange stuff in the Old Testament as being mystical, symbolic foreshadowing of stories in the New Testament. 
I think we might have mentioned this once already. You look at the story of Jonah swallowed by the whale and being spat out on the third day. That becomes uh, an, an analogy, in a sense, for the death of Jesus and his resurrection on the third day. And medieval artists, uh, monks, scribe, illuminators will make this whole elaborate exercise out of connecting Old Testament and New Testament stories. So it's still problematic in places, but it's, it's how they deal with it. Okay? So that's going to start to um, form that decision. Uh, returning to our question of the divinity of Jesus, there are, there's a group that emerges early on that believes in the divinity of Jesus, like complete, he's totally divine, so much so that he's 100% divine and 0% mortal. And this was an early group called the Monophysites. If you look at the root words there, mono means one, physics means substance. This is the one substance school. And this was uh, based in uh, Egypt, among a few mystics, who are really uncomfortable with the idea that if Jesus was God, that he could have been any amount of mortal. Because we live in this meat sack of mostly water, and we have physical urges and hunger and lust and desires. Would God really experience those things? It just seems kind of unseemly to imagine God going through puberty and having morning erections and cutting stinky farts, you know? It's kind of gross being a human. We're, we're animals. God can't be like that. And so they argue that Jesus, though born through the womb of Mary, his divine nature fully subsumed anything mortal, and that Jesus was fully divine his whole life. He wasn't mortal at all. He didn't suffer. He didn't whine. He didn't have weird urges or anything. He's more like, like a hologram beamed down from heaven in the form of a man, so he could talk to us and interact and teach us stuff, but that he wasn't really human at all, fully divine. Now, this did not catch on in a huge way, but uh, can you think about why? I mean, there's something maybe appealing to thinking of God as purely divine and sort of down here glowing among us to give us lessons. That's kind of cool. Why do you suppose this is rejected? Yeah, that's the main problematic thing. The whole central story of Christianity becomes his death on the cross. And if he wasn't really human, he wasn't suffering on the cross. So what was he doing up there? Pretending. He's pretending. He's faking it. He's just sitting there floating up there. Oh, that nail really hurts, Mr. Roman. He's faking the whole thing. And so the idea is that he's just going through the motions to fulfill prophecy and you know, have to teach his stuff and all, but he's not really suffering. And for many Christians, the whole appealing hook of Christianity is that God so loved you that he became one of you, lived among us, know what our lives are like, and suffered horribly, worse than most of us are ever going to suffer, so that he now knows what our pain is like. Jesus, the idea of Jesus being uh, this combination of mortal and divine, he's the nexus that bridges divinity and mortality. When you pray to God through Jesus, it's now with the idea that God knows what your suffering is like. We can relate to each other now. Remember the problem Job had? He's suffering for no reason, just asking God, just tell me what's going on, and he gets screamed at for three pages, right? God doesn't even give him an answer. But now you can relate to him better. That gulf between God and Job has been bridged by Jesus. So without that, it sort of loses a lot of the emotional oomph that the religion is supposed to have. So this gets rejected, but they do in fact still exist today, believe it or not. The Monophysites, uh, continued their existence primarily because they took on this ethnic identity. A lot of like lower class Egyptians gravitated towards this, largely just sort of in opposition to the fact that their Greek speaking uh, political overlords uh, went to the Orthodox view. And so this is just a way of reacting against it. So it, it becomes basically a, a gathering point around which a lot of social unrest uh, could adhere. It's kind of like the reason why Ireland is so Catholic today. You know your more recent history. Why is Ireland so Catholic? Because England went Protestant. When Henry VIII, you know, got rid of the monasteries and declared himself the head of the, you know, the English Church and basically grafted onto uh, Protestantism, the Irish, who have long chafed under English domination, just simply went the other direction. So something like that uh, sort of happened here. So they still exist. It's one of the few ways in the ancient world, without social media and TV and stuff that you can actually adhere a large scattered group of people under one 
one idea, one ideology. And they're still around. They represent about 2% of the Egyptian population today, and they're known as the Coptic Church of Egypt. And it's one of the oldest, continuously practiced uh, churches of Christianity. You occasionally hear about them coming up in the news, uh, some terrorist you know, throws a bomb into their services and stuff like that. Same event with that recently. Okay, so while this was not a major movement, the next one was a major movement. And that is a movement called Arianism, or the Arians. Now please note there is no letter Y in the word Arian. These are not blonde haired, blue eyed people with a superiority complex or anything. Like this is named after a priest whose name, his proper name, was Arius. So these are the followers of Arius. Okay? And the priest Arius, another mystic Alexandrian priest, you'll find Egypt as an early like, seedbed of Christian thought. This priest Arius is contemplating, speculating, praying one day, and he comes to this realization. While we may hold Jesus to be divine, there's no way he can be the equal or on the exact par with God the Father for this one very particular reason. Anybody remember the reason? Part of the nature of God is that he is infinite. He has no beginning and no end. He existed before time began. He'll be here after time is over. Yeah? But Jesus was born at a moment during history. He was born in the middle of things. So if Jesus doesn't share eternity, at least at the beginning and end, with God the Father, he can't be his equal. When God was making Adam and Eve, where was Jesus? He wasn't around yet. During the flood of Noah, where was Jesus? He didn't exist yet. When Moses got the Ten Commandments. Jesus ain't around yet. If he wasn't there for all these important early events, how can he be the equal of God the Father? He might be divine. He's in heaven now. He'll be you know, eternal till you know, the end of things. Well, there's no end of things, but the point is he doesn't share the beginning part of God's eternity. And so based on this, Arius begins preaching a view of Christianity that holds Jesus being divine, but kind of in a subordinate status uh, to the Father God. And this one becomes far more popular for a couple of reasons. One, the Arians were active missionaries. They sent missionaries to the north of Europe and converted a lot of those Germanic tribes who, once they came in, to the Roman Empire were already Christians, but they were Aryan Christians. And then later they had to get reconverted, which just confused them terribly. Um, and the other reason is that this view is sort of logical. It makes sense. I mean, if we have God, Yahweh, and a mortal woman named Mary, and they have a child, Jesus, what's the proportions of his mortality and divinity going to be? going to be 50 /50. This is sort of simplifying Arius' view, but in terms of the way popular people in general would have understood it, he's half divine and half mortal. And this makes sense to Greeks and Romans because their mythology is full of characters like this. What are they called? Demigods. So the popular view just basically presents Jesus as a, one of the demigods. Right? Now, can you name any demigods? Can you say demigods? Hercules. Hercules is a good example to start with. So Hercules. We have his father, Zeus. And who's his mother? And see, I've got to make some corrections. If you saw that horrible Disney movie about Hercules, <laughs> which ruins the story entirely, please just dispel that from your mind. It's not Zeus and his wife here. It's not adorable. No. It's Zeus catting around like he's always doing, and he gets around this princess, a mortal named Alcmena. And Hercules is one of his many bastard children. Here is the one that causes all of his problems and makes him go insane and kill his own wife and kids, and that's why he goes on his 12 labors. Right? So Heracles, or Hercules, as he's more popularly known, is a demigod. Now, in all these stories in Greco-Roman myth about demigods, there's always this sort of built-in tragedy to the nature of their lives. These are characters who feel the power of the gods in them. They are larger than life, beyond mortal, but they're still part mortal. And what does that mean? They're gonna die, like every other crappy mortal. And that sucks. 
Can you imagine feeling divine power, but you still got to die? That's awful. The only way out of this dilemma is for the Diddy God to use the divine powers he's inherited from the divine parent in a way that is so pleasing to them that when they die, that parent has the uh, option of burning away their mortality and resurrecting them as fully divine. And Hercules is one of the very few demigods who achieves this. Achilles and Aeneas, they all die. Most of the demigods still have to die. Hercules is one of the few that escapes it. And so that's how this works. Now, Hercules, like all these demigods, inherits some particular superpower from the divine parent. What does Hercules inherit? Strength. strength. Super strength. How does he use the super strength? What are the 12 labors mostly all about? He kills monsters, right? Yeah. Well, there's, most, and there's a few other weird ones, but mostly he's out there killing monsters. Does killing monsters benefit humanity? Yeah. Yeah, yeah because monsters eat humans, right? Yeah. So he helps out humanity by killing the monsters that would otherwise prey upon us. So Hercules dies. He does, in fact, die. Zeus decides this kid was all right, burns off his mortality, and makes Hercules fully divine, brings him up to Mount Olympus, gives him a divine wife, and Hercules will live forevermore on Mount Olympus. And if you ever need his help, you can pray to him. If your wagon gets stuck in the mud, pray to Hercules to send you the strength. He'll push that thing out. All right? So he's there forever now. But if Zeus and Hercules were to arm wrestle one day, who's going to win? Zeus. Zeus. Hercules might be the god of strength itself, but Zeus is the one that made him that way. So he's always going to be superior. There's no way Hercules could ever beat his dad in any kind of physical contest. All right? Take that model of thinking, this Greco-Roman pagan paradigm, and apply it here. We have a divine parent, a mortal parent, and a demigod. What is the superpower that Jesus inherits from his dad? What does he do in the Gospels? Yeah, he preaches love. It's not super love he inherits. It's healing powers, exactly. So Jesus inherits this divine power to heal people. How does he use his divine power? Goes around, goes around. He helps people out, right? He helps people that, that need some healing. Blind people, lame people, he heals them. Does he charge money for it? No. Does he only heal like rich people that can give him an assist in life? No, he reaches out to everybody and helps everybody out. So he uses his superpowers in a benevolent way for humanity. Jesus dies. He does in fact die, right? Who resurrects Jesus? Does he resurrect himself from the grave? No. no. God the Father resurrects him from the grave. And so now Jesus is fully divine. He will live forever. He needs him up. He will pray to him. But if Yahweh and Jesus were to arm wrestle one day, who's going to win? Yahweh. Yahweh's going to win in this line of thought. So this is how common people were able to understand this kind of theology. It doesn't really do justice to the sophistication of Arius himself, but the widespread following is partly because it made sense, and partly because they actively recruited people and went on missionary uh, journeys. In fact, the story of Jesus is really very similar to another demigod that you've probably never heard of before, but it was very popular uh, in the late antique world. He's the son of the god Apollo. Apollo is the god of a whole lot of things uh, for the ancients. Uh, he's got the sun and the archery, of uh, medicine, of philosophy, everything classical and civilized, thing that makes us you know, better than the animals. Apollo presides over that. There's also this running joke in Greek myth that Apollo can never get laid. There's all these stories where he gives his gifts to his priestesses and they turn him down when he wants to close the deal. So the stories of Apollo and Daphne and Apollo and Cassandra. He's always getting, he's always getting shot down, kind of a nerd or something. Anyway, Apollo finally gets lucky with one of his priestesses. And he has a kid named Asclepius, or Asclepius in the Latin. And Asclepius inherits from Apollo healing powers. He is the demigod who is actually the ancient god who is the founder of the medical arts. Asclepius carries around a staff with a serpent entwined around it, which, remember, isn't always a symbol of evil, wicked deceivers. Serpents, because they shed their skin and seem to renew themselves, were symbolic of the life force. And serpents were often a very positive symbol in the Greek world. And where do you today see uh, symbols with a staff and serpents coiled around it? It's our medical symbol today, exactly. So the staff of Asclepius is something that you all have seen before, you all recognize. And Asclepius basically taught the healing arts to humanity. And there were temples to Asclepius all over the uh, Roman world. 
They were essentially the hospitals of antiquity. If you were sick, you had some recurring problem, you went to the temple, you spent the night in the temple, and then in the morning you told your dreams to the priest who then interpreted it and figured out which the source of your illness was and how to go about treating it. Okay? So actually some early Christians were accused of basically just ripping off Asclepius stories and attaching them to Jesus because they sounded so similar. They both have miraculous healing gifts uh, that they used to benefit humanity. Okay, so this becomes a widespread popular uh, belief in the early fourth century, early 300s. And of course, you all recall that in 313, Emperor Constantine is going to legalize Christianity. So he's first dominant in the Western world. Then he finally asserts his power over the Eastern world. And Constantine manages basically to unite the entire empire under his rule, and along the way legalizing Christianity, which, among other things, was a savvy political move. He saw that we had this you know, strong minority growing that just can't be extinguished. Why fight him? Get him to join your cause. So his army is full of Christian soldiers at this point as well. And he gets uh, basically everything all tamped down on the political military front, and then he discovers that all of his Christians are arguing with each other over the nature of the divinity of Jesus, or is the Son equal to the Father, and there have been arguments in the streets of Constantinople over this. Constantine, like any emperor, doesn't really care what you believe. They just want peace in the empire, and they want people to pay their taxes. They just don't want to cause any trouble. So seeing that they're not going to resolve their differences themselves, Constantine decides, all right, you guys are going to solve this, and he calls together the first general council of Christianity, the first official big group meeting, which is called the Council of Nicaea. Nicaea is a town in southern Turkey, a little south of Turkey, I think, uh, in Asia Minor, in the eastern coast. So the Council of Nicaea is called in 325. And the idea is all you squabbling Christians just need to get together, hash it out, debate, argue all you want, but then come to a decision that's going to be the official version of this church. I have made you guys official. You have imperial connections now. Stop embarrassing me. Y'all need to get it together. All right? Constantine himself presided over the Council of Nicaea. He ran it like any emperor does in parliamentary fashion. They invited envoys from all over the Christian world to come. It was a very hot summer that year in 325. I imagine they were probably a little nervous showing up. They've only been a legal religion for about a decade or so, and now all of a sudden the emperor's angry at us and gathering us all up together. Who knows what's going to happen? They get there, and Constantine says, look, you guys have all these internal debates. You need to hash it all out. And he lets everybody have their time speaking. All right? The envoy from Alexandria, what is your position? All right, good. The envoy from Nicaea, your position. Constantinople, what is your position? He let everybody talk. Just ran the meeting. says, okay. These seem to be the points of debate. Let's form a bunch of subcommittees and y'all argue these things out. You guys go argue if Jesus was made out of stuff that was at one point created by God and whether that matters, et cetera. And everybody's got to go argue these points. Gathers them all back together. All right, guys, everybody done arguing? Everybody made your closing arguments? Good. Let's vote. And it came down to the, the big debate. There was a lot of things they debated, but the big one was about Arianism. And his major opponent, was a bishop named Athanasius. Athanasius is the most important, influential Christian you have never heard of before. He's about to win this debate. He's also going to decide what went in your New Testament. We have a document in his own handwriting, an original document uh, as an old man from the year 367, that is a table of contents for what he thought ought to go in the New Testament. It's not a complete... New Testament Gospel, it's just a table of books. And it's the same 27 books in the same order as you still have them in your New Testament today. This is what St. Jerome used when he made his translation from the Greek original into Latin. And at that point, it just becomes the de facto uh, reality that's your New Testament. He made that decision as well. And he's about to make a decision that's going to shape one of the, the most important doctrines within Christianity. You'll see it coming. It'll, it'll sound familiar. So it's time for everybody to vote. Everybody that agrees with the priest Arius, raise your hand. Count the votes. Everybody that agrees with Athanasius, the alternate view, which we're about to explain, raise your hand. And Athanasius wins. According to tradition, the vote was 300 to 3. 
we have no reason whatsoever to actually believe these numbers. This is written by a Christian historian about 40 years or so uh, after the fact, and uh, you know, probably you know, making the side that wins look you know, overwhelmingly dominant. Who knows what the real vote was? But uh, Athanasius wins. And so the view of Arius is going to be rejected. He becomes the next heretic, a long line of them. And to make sure that everybody now stays on board and understands what it is you're supposed to believe, they decide, let's just write all of this up in a formal statement. And we'll let every Christian, every time they go to Mass, recite this. And if they keep saying it over and over again, they'll get it memorized and they'll have it straight, what they're supposed to believe. Let's turn to page 99 of your readers. Page 99. And here we have the document that emerges from the Council of Nicaea called the Nicene Creed. The statement of belief that is going to be the official statement of the church. Listen to the words. This is the original, more legalistic phrasing of it. Uh, but it's going to be very familiar to you, those of you that have grown up in the Catholic Church. We believe in one God. So we're monotheists. The Father Almighty maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten of his Father, of the substance of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God. You're pounding this point in? They are pissed off. They've been arguing with these people for years, and they're finally making this emphatic statement, we're not going to be the Arians. All this thing about the difference between the Father and the Son, no. Same saying. God of God, light of light, no difference. Stop saying there's a difference. You can hear the anger coming through in this. And then here's the important line. <sighs> the only begotten, he was begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. Begotten, not made. Begotten is an old-fashioned term. What does it mean? Like in the Bible, we have your begats. You know, Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and so on. You know, begotten. Right? He's born. Old-fashioned way of saying someone was born to somebody. Right? So to say that he's begotten, what they're saying, what they're emphasizing is that, okay, Jesus was born, yeah, he was born through the womb of the Virgin Mary, okay. But that doesn't mean he was created in her womb, the way all of us were created in the womb of our mothers. He didn't come into existence in the womb. He already existed. He was born through Mary, but he was still eternal. Because they've got to deal with Arius' objection. I mean, he's got a good point. If Jesus was born in the middle of history, how could he equal to God the Father? They've got to answer that somehow. So this is the answer, that yes, he was born, but not exactly made. Let's go on, and then we'll try to diagram this out. Being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, both which be in heaven and on earth, who for us men and our salvation came down and was incarnate. What does incarnate mean? If you order chili con carne, what comes with the beans? Spanish speakers? Meat. meat. <laughs> carne means meat. So to say that he was incarnate means he was in meatified. He, he was put into a meat sack, like we are. Okay? So he's got a, a, an actual physical body. He was incarnate and made man. He suffered. Meaning we're also not the monophysites. They're making a point that he actually suffered, unlike what they say. In the third day he rose again and ascended into heaven. Also we believe in the Holy Ghost. They're going to have to start thinking about that a little more, but as long as they're defining things, they throw that in there as well. And then get the tone of the ending of this. And whosoever shall say that there was a time when the Son of God was not, or that before he was begotten he was not, or that he was made of things that were not, or that he is of a different substance or essence, or that he's a creature or subject to change or conversion. Can you hear the echoes of all the subcommittee meetings they had as they argued out every little nuanced detail of the implications of the Arian point of view? They're rejecting all of it. 
And anybody that says so, the Catholic and Apostolic Church anathematizes them. That's a fun word. What does it mean to pronounce anathema upon somebody? You are cursed. You are outside Christian law. We no longer care about you or protect you. You go to hell, you go to hell when you die. So they're pretty darn serious, and they're angry. Now, eventually, they're going to sort of water down the wording, soften it out a little bit, add a few more details about Pontius Pilate and stuff like that. Uh, but you hear, you Catholics hear the language of something that you grew up calling what? No, that's the uh, Lord's Prayer. Yeah, Lord's the Apostles' Prayer. Creed. The Apostles' Creed. Yeah. Catholics call this the later version of it they come up with. The Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> Remember, the whole point is we're trying to figure out what will keep a universal church and what the apostles would have thought of this if we could ask them. The Catholic and Apostolic Church, they're declaring themselves. When you call something the Apostles' Creed, and you grow up from childhood hearing that, it sort of sounds like the apostles got together over tea one day and decided, let's define the beliefs of our faith. That is not how it came about. They're having a hot, angry debate in a miserable hot summer and they're sick of this. And they're essentially rejecting all the other views. The, the triumphant view is they're drawing up a statement that emphatically rejects all the other competing views that they were concerned with at the time. It's not that they came together to formulate it. In many ways, the Apostles' Creed comes about like a, like a, a pinball bouncing off of bumpers and stuff. They're reacting to all these ideas they don't like, and they end up shaping a point of view out of all of this. And that point of view essentially deals with the question of the divinity of Jesus by making a declaration of what very important concept in Christianity. God is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. What is that called? No, the, Trinity. the Trinity. So this is the statement of the Trinity. We have a triune God. We have a God that is one being but has three faces, three countenances, three aspects to him, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And it's, when you think about it, it's sort of a, a strange compromise they're trying to make between the idea that they're monotheistic, but we have Jesus, who's also divine, and God divine, that's two, seemingly two gods, and you have the Holy Spirit in there, and you got three. So they're trying to find a way to, to bridge this gap and to find a compromise solution that's gonna make sense to them. But in the end, if we were to look at this same running equation we've been doing, what does this make Jesus in terms of divinity and mortality? He's 100% divine and? And he's 100% mortal. What does that add up to? 200%. Is that rational? No. No, that defies rationality, in which percentages need to add up to 100%. Welcome to religion. Not everything is going to be rational. This is called a mystery of the faith. How can Jesus be fully divine and fully mortal at the same time? It's a mystery of the faith. Sometimes religion just asks you to accept the mystery. There's lots of Christianity. How can God be completely good, and yet he created the devil? It's a mystery. How can God know all things that will happen even in the future and you still somehow have free will when he already knows what you're going to do? It's the answer, folks. It's a mystery. So you just have to accept that sometimes. All right. Now, as one other way of trying to basically graph out what they're describing here, I'm going to put it in simple terms. Here's the, here's the Dr. Brooks rendition of what the Nicene Creed implies. You know I like timelines, right? Here we go. There is a timeline of all human history. In biblical terms, this is Genesis 1-1. Down here is Revelations, the end of days. All human history takes place within these defined parameters. Biblical terms. God, however, transcends all this. He existed before anything else existed. He'll continue existing afterwards. What happens to us? Well, that's another mystery. So God is eternal. So 
Okay, I'm going to use blue to represent God the Father. He transcends this in both directions. Pick a color to be Jesus. Red. Or red. Right. So this is God the Son, Jesus. And he came into the world, and the royal purple for this, through the womb of the Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary's a woman. And he left this world on the cross. Right? Down here is history. This is all of us. We're all right in there somewhere. Okay? Now, Arius wanted to argue that Jesus was created in the womb of Mary, therefore he wouldn't have this eternity on this side. He might have it over here, but that's not equal to God the Father. What the Arians are arguing instead is like, no, no, no. He was begotten, but not made in the womb. He was born into history through the womb of Mary, but he existed beforehand. So God the Son, red, also eternal. He just had this special role to play where he enters history, lived among us for 33 years, and then left on the cross. He's also going to come back again at the end of days, so, you know, everybody look busy. <laughs> I got green left to be the Holy Spirit. How did the Holy Spirit get into all this? It's also an eternal part of this triune divinity. What is the function of the Holy Spirit? What does it do? The Holy Spirit is like. God's vehicle through which to do miracles and make changes in history. God's like an emperor. This is all emerged in the ancient world. Emperors don't run around doing chores. They send envoys and ambassadors to go and act their will. So God doesn't run around doing chores. The Holy Spirit is what does that. The Holy Spirit, even though they didn't realize it was there in the Old Testament, turning people into pillars of salt and causing other miracles, stuff like that to happen. Holy Spirit came and told Mary the good news. Holy Spirit came and gave him a little comfort on the cross. He comes down, he comes down and comforts martyrs when they're in their death and they have amazing bravery. Holy Spirit gives them that courage and that comfort. When miracles are happening, demons are being driven out, water being turned into wine, the Holy Spirit that comes down and does that. I'll try to use terms that you may recall. Think of the Holy Spirit as God's go-go action arm. All right? He's up there, but it was time to do something. Hey, my martyr needs help. Go, go, action, Holy Spirit. Boom. Send it down to him. I got to drive out that demon. Go, go, action, Holy Spirit. Send it down to him. All right? Y'all remember that cartoon, right? Yeah. All right. So think of it as that. Basically, it's God's envoy, the part of him that interacts with history and performs miracles because that's what a miracle is. When God alters the way that nature typically operates, when he makes some change in that, that is the definition of miracle. And that's the function of the Holy Spirit. So there you have it. A triune God, a statement of the Trinity, reacting against these other ideas that had come along, these other schools of thought. The Nicene Creed rejects all of those, formulates a statement that's going to get revised over the years, and eventually becomes the so-called Apostles' Creed that all you Catholics grew up reciting every time you went to Mass, right? And they've been reciting that since the 4th century. We figure after almost 1,700 years, having everybody recite these words, dang it, we're going to keep people on the proper orthodox path of belief. So those are the first three of our uh, fascinating heresies that we'll look at. But there's one more that's going to have to have a day all of its own. So when I see you next time, we'll reach out and talk about some of the most intriguing of ancient heretics who also left some really interesting Christian heretical documents behind. We'll come back and talk about the Gnostics.